At the age of 16 years old, the son of a nobleman was captured from his homeland in Britain by a band of pirates and taken to Ireland. He was sold to a cruel master and a pagan warlord. Like the prodigal son in the Bible, Patrick remembered better days. Who would, who would have thought that the cherished son of a nobleman would be tending sheep and cattle? The seed of truth which he had been taught but not embraced now found receptive soil in his heart. Later in his life, he would write of this time. The love and the fear of God and, and faith increased so much and the spirit of prayer so grew within me that I often prayed a hundred times in a day. The spirit was burning within me. Captivity became a training ground for his future mission. After six years of slavery, Patrick heard a voice in his dream telling him, Behold, the ship is ready for you. He escaped and miraculously journeyed home. Patrick's family begged him, to, ne him never to leave them again, but the calling of his heavenly father to return to Ireland had to be obeyed. Forsaking comfort, he was compelled to bring God's love to those who were once his captors. Returning to Ireland, Patrick used a pagan feast day to demonstrate God's power over all over Ireland, fires were to be extinguished until a signal blaze was lit but druid by druid priests at Terra. On the hill of Slain opposite the valley of Terra, Patrick lit a fire to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The druids warned the king that unless the fire was put out, it would blaze forever in this land. Repeated efforts were made to kill the one who had lit the fire. The druids and magicians used all their occultic power, but they had no power to harm the one who represented the all-powerful God. As a result, the king of Ireland gave Patrick the permission to preach his faith throughout Ireland. During his 30 years of ministry in Ireland, he dedicated 350 bishops, established at least 300 churches, baptized over 120,000 Irishmen. After his death, it would be the Irish who returned as missionaries to England, Scotland, France, Belgium, and Germany. St. Patrick was a history, was, was a history maker and a world changer. Through a life molded and yielded by Christ, he became a spiritual giant for the Lord. Through his willingness to answer the call of the Lord, he became a pen in the hands of God and knew. A new chapter in church history unfolded, being used by God. A pen in the hand of God. Yes. This morning I'd like to share with you a story of a man, of a man whose life and ministry was short, but yet his life had such a strong impact on the early church. Through him, the gospel which remained largely in Jerusalem penetrated into Samaria. Through him, the gospel went further into Asia Minor and even Europe. This man is none other than Stephen. We will look at his short life and see what it, what, what it took for Stephen to become a pen in the hands of God. Number one, he was a man who was a servant. When we think of a man filled with spirit, the picture that comes to our mind is that of a preacher moving powerfully in signs and wonders and miracles. The Bible says that Stephen is a man full of faith and full of spirit. However, the first picture we see of Stephen is not one doing mighty deeds for God. Instead, he was asked by the apostles to serve tables as, as a deacon, doing what, what you know most people would think ain't really what being an apostle is supposed to do, being used of God in, in ways that you don't think you're going to be used. A lot of people think when you're called in the ministry, when God's using you, when you're a pen in God's hand, He's writing your story. If you're called by God, you're going to have to be standing behind a pulpit. Or you're going to have to be up here on the platform. Or you're going to be doing, calling out people and ministering to them. But that's not the case. I've told you that before I even started preaching, well, I picked up paper off the floor. Amen. Well, that's being used to God. That's being Amen. a pen in the hand of God. Yes. When you do things that you think that don't, don't get noticed, don't get recognized, picking a piece of paper off the floor, we, we laughed about it. I plunged toilets while they was in there shouting, 
You know, that's that's being what God wants you to yeah. do. Being out there in the parking lot, parking cars, where people don't know how to park, get in the church. That's being used to God. That's being a pen in the hands of God. The term deacon is derived from the Greek word diakonos, which is usually translated servant or minister. That's what he wants you to be, a servant. He wants you to serve. Now, when the apostle asked if he would consider serving as a deacon, he embraced it as a call from God and in humility began to serve tables. Humility is crucial to the anointed life. Stephen was a pen whom God could use to write history because he was a man of character, a man who seeks to be like Christ, who came to serve and not to be served. A lot of times we think that we, you know, we come to church and it's my turn to sit back. Let me let me receive something. It's not all about receiving sometimes. It's about doing it. It's about being what God wants you to be, being used by Him. Such humility and, and, and spirit of servanthood must be maintained if we seek to be used by God to pen history. You may think the little bit that I do in the church doesn't go a long way. The little bit that what, what little bit I do, it doesn't go noticed. It doesn't. No, it, it might not go noticed by man, but it gets noticed by God because you're doing something that someone else would have to do. You're taking up that place. You're, you're using that servanthood of what God wants you to do. Yeah. Uh, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Humility and servanthood is crucial to the anointed life. Without humility, the anointed man becomes an arrogant man. Have you ever seen someone that's just arrogant? They don't have humility. They don't have uh, that that drawback. They don't have any that that that. It's just arrogance. Oh, it's just I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. I I I me me me. That is not a useful pen in the hands of God. In recent in recent times, many anointed men had lost the sense of humility and became arrogant. Trading the anointing for a price. Why? Because they lost the spirit of servanthood. When you lose, lose the ability to, God, I want to do what you want me to do. When you lose that, then God puts your pen down. You're not doing what God wants you to do. You're not trying to serve people now. You're not doing what God has called you to do. You have stepped up into your own level then. And God puts your pen down because he, you've left him all together. Your, your humility is, is not, you're, you're not able to sit back and, and say, you always have to be in the spotlight. I don't have to be in the spotlight. I can tell you that right now. I don't have to be in the spotlight. Somebody else can take the reins, go do what they need to do. I don't have to be there. For St. Patrick, God had to take him out of his life of comfort mold him before using him. We have to ask ourselves, do you always look for a place of promise or are you willing to serve in a place of humility? We don't always have to look for that spotlight. We don't always have to look to, you know, oh, I want it to be all about me or, or if the move of God takes place, I want it to be me that's there. Or, you know, I want to be used by God, but, you know, I want other people to be used, but I want it to be me, 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 me. No, you, we don't have to look for that. But we're willing to serve. Let God use somebody else and then you step in and, and help, help them. Be a helper. Be a servant. A man who is full of the Spirit. Stephen was a pen in God's hand because he was a man full of the Spirit. Stephen was a man who was full of the Spirit of God. The fullness of the Spirit in Stephen is first characterized by faith. Have you ever seen an anointed man who is full of fear and unbelief? A spirit-filled man it doesn't have fear, doesn't have unbelief. All the men and women of God uh, whom I've known in person or, or read in books or, or things I've, I've heard about are all men and women of faith. They step forward in faith. They don't have that fear. They don't have that unbelief. If, if, if you have to have that faith that when I proclaim what God has told me to tell you, I proclaim it in faith, I know it's going to happen. God is not a God that lies. He is not one that's not going to do anything. He's not going to be what he, you claim him to be. He's not going to not do that. 
When you walk in the Spirit, naturally you become a man of faith. The Holy Spirit will develop faith in your heart as you journey with Him. When you study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to believe those words are true and that God will fulfill them. That's, you have to believe what God tells you. If God is writing, your, you're using you as a pen to write your life, and he writes down something in your book, and then you look at it, and you have this belief. Well, who are we to, to not believe the author of our book? Who are we to not believe what God himself has wrote down in our pages? We cannot, we cannot go against what God has, has wrote down in our book. Uh, Stephen's faith is seen when he's he sprung into action in chapter 7. He was a deacon in the church, but outside the church, his faith caused him to preach the gospel and perform signs and wonders through the name of Christ. He did not wait for a position to be given to him before he started preaching the gospel. The faith within him stirred him into action. I can remember Daddy telling me, Brother Kenneth, the first message that he ever preached, Brother Ray told him that, that he would stand out there by the, uh, they had a, a spot over a little few minutes, but uh, to stand out there by the tracks, by the police station, and they meet, and, and preach the word of God. And then he said he was so excited about it, he said when he got there, he said he opened up his Bible, and a few people would gather around, and he started talking, and the train went through. <laughs> but he wasn't looking for a full position he was just doing what God wanted him to do, right? Being a willing, being a pen in God's hand. He didn't have to be standing behind a big pulpit. He didn't have to be standing uh, in a church filled with thousands of people. He was standing there, and probably the only one that heard him was himself. And I told Ben, I said, well, "Maybe you needed to hear that message." <laughs> but I tell you what, we don't have to have just great things. It doesn't have to be a that person that you witnessed to, Brother Trace, on your job. It don't have to be, it don't have to be a, you standing behind a pulpit preaching to them. You're preaching to them enough when you witness to them there on that job. You right. tell them, hey, God loves you. There's a person that loves you more than anybody else. I know a person that can change your life just like he's changed mine. That is not waiting for a, a position to be handed out. That is doing what God has started in you to do. You're taking that into action. Faith is not a passive word. Faith is an active word. Faith is, is taking action and doing what God wants you to do. Secondly, the fullness of the Spirit was characterized by his understanding of the Word. When Stephen spoke to the religious authorities, he demonstrated his understanding of the Word and with such wisdom that it infuriated the Pharisees. It made people mad. If you want to become a man full of the Spirit, you must study the Word of God. Many of us feed our physical body, but we starve our spirit. I've been there. I can see right here. I've been there. I'll feed the spiritual man. I'll feed this natural man when it's hungry, but then I'll starve my spiritual man. If you want to become a man full of spirit, study, study the word of God. Studying the word of God, not through the Holy Spirit, causes God's anointing to grow in our lives. Stephen studied the Word of God and he became a man full of the Spirit. Yeah. Stephen's fullness of the Spirit was also characterized by his sight. Stephen was a man of devotion and had close communion with the Lord. How do you know this? At the darkest moment of his life, instead of looking the dangers that lurked or the angry mob that was about to kill him, Stephen's sight was placed on God. When they were fixing to kill him, Instead of looking at the people that was fixing to do it, instead of looking at the problem that he was going through, his eyes were fixed on God. All right. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing right at the right hand of God. I cannot say that if someone's fixing to take my life, I would be looking directly at them, seeing what they're doing. That I, I couldn't say that I would be looking up to heaven at God. I would say that I would hope that by that time, if that would happen, that I would have the faith in Him to just keep my eyes fixated on Him. Yes. For Stephen to do that at such a moment, he must be in one intimate relationship with God. 
Right. That meant God meant more to him than anything in his life. Yes. I believe that Stephen was so close to, to, to God's heart that at that moment Jesus stood on his feet for Stephen. The anointed man is one who has, has learned to draw strength and power from God through an intimate relationship with him. I've always said it. You've got to have a personal relationship with God. And that is why Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. We have got to have that personal relationship with God. Stephen's fullness of the Spirit is characterized by his prayer life. His prayer at his moment of death shows that he is a man of prayer. The falling on his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. That's a man of prayer. That's a man of forgiveness. That's a man of humility. A man of humbleness. A man that was used a pen in the hand of God. He was a man who dares to sacrifice. Stephen was a man who, who dared to sacrifice, and sacrifice he did to the extent of losing his life, his earthly life that he had for God. Every single person whom God used to pen history are people who dared to sacrifice. Abraham sacrificed at every junct junction and was even willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. He became the father of many nations. David sacrificed at every junction, and he even said that he will not offer a sacrifice that cost him nothing. He was called by God as the king after God's own heart. Are we after God's heart? Or are we willing to make that much of a sacrifice that we're after? Oh, I, want, I, want, I want God in my life. Or are we truly a man and woman after God's own heart? Right? Yeah. Are we truly wanting what God wanted? Are we truly... Just lay the book open, lay the pages open blank, and say, God, take me and use me as the pen that you're going to write. What, what, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it ends up like. But I know if you write it, God, if you use me as the pen, there's no choice for it to turn out the way that it needs to turn out. All right. Paul sacrificed it, giving up of, of fame. He followed the, the way of giving up personal freedom. He chose to be arrested so that he can preach the gospel to the king. The only, he knew the only way that he could reach them was to be arrested. He knew that coming to them as just a man on his own, he would not be able to preach. But he chose to be arrested. That way he knew he would be moved into where the kings were and he could preach the gospel to them. He became the greatest apostle in many of the New Testament wrote a lot of the New Testament. Patrick sacrificed his personal comfort and safety in order to see his vision of reaching Ireland with the gospel to come to pass. We, we have to learn to sacrifice at every junction in our life. What, what is it that you need to sacrifice? We have to ask ourselves that question. What do I have to sacrifice? What do I, 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 we talked last, I testified last night, Brother, Brother Joey said he can remember it was, he said it felt unusual having church on a Saturday night. I said, he said it, we used to have it Sunday morning. So I said, we had it Sunday morning, Sunday night, had Bible study on Mondays, had youth service Tuesday night, had a break on Wednesday, back to regular service Thursday. And then by, during one of those off nights, I was like, yeah, we had an off night. Was, I think we're going to go help this church. But by doing that, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the yield. The greater the sacrifice, the more God uses you. So the more we put ourselves to the side, the more I don't try to be my own pen and my own author, and I let God be the author, and I let him use me as the pen, the, the, the greater the blessing, the greater the yield, the greater the, the greater works I'm going to see take place in my life. I prayed one time, so I told the Lord, you know, every given opportunity, Use me to, to impact life, people, people's lives. Yeah. I try, I, 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 you know, I cry, I said, Lord, every, every chance you get that I'm not being me, I'm not being stupid, not being hard-headed, use me to impact people's lives. Because I, at a time, I was like, oh, you know, God, I work a little salty. I, I love pallets. I, I don't, I, I'm not, you're not going to use me. I, I, we put down on ourselves, we doubt ourselves. Come on. 
But I sat there truly one day and looked from the, at the amount of people that I see in a day's time, truck drivers, people unloading, people that I load. I have seen so many people that other people wouldn't see in a day's time. That is my chance to witness to somebody. That is my chance to take up and say, God, use me as a pen that you want to write in my book what you, how, what you want me to tell them. Use me, God. You, no, I, it don't have to be me preaching to a church. It, it don't have to be me right. after ministering to a right. thousand people. That person that come in driving that truck one day, brother, and he, it, he might have been on his last bit of sanity. God, use me to speak something into their life. That way they'll go on and tell them, you know, I was at, the, I was at that job and I was, I was loving one of my life. And this young man talked talk to me about God. Don't know where it comes from, out of the blue, you just started talking. God, use me to reach people. I want to be a pen in the hand of God. I want to be, I, you know, I want history to unfold through my life. It don't have to be something great. It don't have to be something that people read about in books later on in their life. Just use me. Sometimes when it comes to making history, we think of something gigantic, something huge, something something that, uh, you know, changes history in, in leaps and bounds. But sometimes it happens, that, you know, it's just something small, something tiny, something minuscule. For Stephen, his life was such a waste when he died so early in ministry. At the point of death, Stephen would not have known that through his life, God was to pen the next chapter of history for the church. Through him, God would spur and follow Deacon Philip to travel to Samaria to preach the gospel. Through the prayers he uttered, God was, was, was to touch a hardcore murderer, Saul, and use him to spread the gospel to Asia Minor and all over the world. When you just let God have the reins, when you open the book up and say, God, use me. Take my pen. Write my life. Yes. Are you a pen in God's hands? Yes. Glory. Yes. 